It is a strange book, written by a pioneer in the study of the human mind. It reads like a dark version of scripture, filled with Gnostic terminology and attributed to the ancient heretic Basilides. During his lifetime, Carl Jung only produced a few copies of Seven Sermons to the Dead, handing them out to a select group of friends and students. After his death, this work was poured over by occultists, New Agers, and all sorts of heterodox spiritual seekers. In its oblique passages, they contended, there was real wisdom to be found. In this video, we'll analyze the key concepts in Seven Sermons to the Dead. This isn't just about Jung or about his weird little work of Gnostic fan fiction. Seven Sermons to the Dead is indicative of a larger trend in modern spirituality, one that could jeopardize the soul of anyone who embraces it. Now, I could perform a detailed academic analysis of these sermons, unpacking their dense language and themes, but if you've ever tried to read them, you know, that won't make for a very good video. Instead, let's imagine that you found an old VHS tape in a thrift shop. It's by some goofy spiritual teacher who's trying to explain Jung's book to his followers. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like you to meet Guru Doug. Hello, I'm Guru Doug. Welcome to I Am Special, You're Special. I love you. Seven Sermons to the Dead. Hmm, sounds creepy, but it's not creepy. It's very special. Let's read. Let's start with Sermon 1. The dead came back from Jerusalem, where they found not what they sought, they prayed me, let them in, and besought my word, and thus I began my teaching. Did you know that nothingness and fullness are the same thing? Everything equals nothing. Didn't know that? Think about it. Okay. Well, this nothing and everything, this all and none of it together, that's what Jung calls the pleroma. Let's imagine it as a big ocean, as Mother Ocean, from which everything and nothing is born. Anything that exists floating around in this ocean is what we call creatura. It's us and everything else. Now, pleroma is what we're floating in, and we've got plenty of water in ourselves. But we're not the pleroma. We're creatura. Pleroma is everything and nothing. It contains all opposites within itself. Let's read. The effective and the ineffective, fullness and emptiness, living and dead, difference and sameness, light and darkness, the hot and the cold, force and matter, time and space, good and evil, beauty and ugliness, the one and the many etc. Pleroma is everything and nothing. It contains all of these contradictions within itself. But in the Pleroma, they cancel each other out. But in us, we get attached to one or another of these qualities and we start to feel stressed and icky. If you go to church, they'll tell you to do good. But when you're grabbing at the good, you'll get a handful of evil, because good and evil are opposites, and you can't have one without the other. So you shouldn't try to be good. You shouldn't try to be anything. You should just try to be. Let's read. In the night, the dead stood along the wall and cried, We would have knowledge of God. Where is God? Is God dead? Don't be scared. I love you. God is not dead. But it's not the kind of God you learned about in church. You see, God is part of creatura. God is a distinct something, and being part of creatura 
emerging from the pleroma, it contains an opposite. If God is absolute fullness, then absolute emptiness is devil. If God is creation, devil is destruction. But both God and devil, both creation and destruction, possess effectiveness. Or rather, one might say, they are possessed by it. Because effectiveness is common to both, it is above both. It is a god above god and devil. And this god is called Abraxas. Now, if you're a Christian, you might feel a little stressed. Let's read. The dead now raised a great tumult, for they were Christians. Don't be stressed. I love you. Innumerable as the host of the stars is the number of gods and devils, and you shouldn't worship any of them, especially the one you heard about in church. See, it says right here. Let's read. By our prayer, we can add to it nothing, and from it nothing take, because the effective void swalloweth all. So chill out. There's a better solution. But the dead got bored with all this talk. They said, Cease this talk of gods and daemons and souls. At the bottom, this hath long been known to us. By now, it's night time. And the dead are getting tired. Let's read. Yet when night was come, the dead again approached with lamentable mane and said, there is yet one matter we forgot to mention. Teach us about man. Now we learn what all of this means. The world of gods and men and pleroma and creatura. It's all happening inside of you. You are a gateway into this sacred world. Step inside yourself and look up and you'll see a star. That star is Pleroma. It's your very self, your unconscious, your God. It's the only God to whom you should pray. And you're so close, but you're so far away. In this new world, you're not just you, you're Abraxas. You're both God and the devil. You need to move beyond all pairs of opposites and anything that might possess you. Then you can finally be yourself. A great deal of ink has been spilled interpreting Jung's weird manifesto. I tried to simplify things and to make its ideas as coherent as possible, as briefly as possible. Instead of picking each sermon apart, I think it would be most useful to examine a single foundational concept that recurs consistently throughout the text. This idea is one on which his whole argument rests and highlights what I mean about the dangerous qualities of seven sermons to the dead. See, Jung has a fundamental misunderstanding about the nature of God. This is a misunderstanding that the authors of the New Testament don't share. In the first epistle of John, for example, we read, God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. So often among those who are spiritual but not religious, we hear platitudes like, you can't have light without darkness or good without evil. But that makes a presupposition about what good and evil are, and seems to imply that God and the devil are evenly matched. For ancient Christians, this assumption would be ludicrous. So, if God is the maker of all things and God is good, how can evil exist? The theologian Pseudo Dionysus, writing in the early centuries of the church, offers an illuminating answer. He states that unlike good, evil is not an actual thing, and it's not some sort of quality that exists in any being. Evil isn't a power, it comes into being by reason of weakness. Even the demons, he says, are both from the good, meaning God, and good. But demons are evil, right? 
of course, but it's because there's a weakness in them. They were created as angels and became corrupted. Their proper nature is to serve and worship God, and the demons, out of pride, turn from this high calling. In the words of Pseudo-Dionysus, it's a failure to live up to the angelic perfection befitting them. Since these former angels don't seek after the good, and since God is the good and the source of all being, they aspire, he writes, to the non-existent. And this is not aspiration, but a missing of true aspiration. If we understand good and evil in this light, we can't see them as opposite poles in a cosmic struggle. On the contrary, evil is an aberration, a malady in a being that was formed by a loving and benevolent father. This father is not a symbol, not an archetype, and not some afterbirth who tumbled from the pleroma. He is the one who spoke the cosmos into existence with a word. This word, God from God, became flesh, and by his death and resurrection, Jesus reconciled the world to himself. Believe what you like, but I'll take that over Abraxas any day.